Hello, writers. I'm Josiane Fortin, and today I'm interviewing Michael French. So Michael has published 22 books, including fiction, young adult fiction, biographies, and art criticism. So welcome on the podcast, Michael. And please start off by telling us a little bit about you. Um, is that past, present, or... or <laughs> um, well, um, I'm relatively old, I think, for um, a lot of people, fellow writers. I mean, I've been writing since I was 18, and that must have been over 50 years ago. <laughs> when, I was, when I was much younger and I met somebody who was 76, I'd say, gosh, are they old? <laughs> you know? And then the shoe always you know, drops on you. So um, it's great, as long as you're in good health and your mind is alert and you're yeah. in terms of writing, if you think you're still on, a, on an... Um, an upward trajectory and you can improve and you um, and you see that, um, that's what I like. But uh, who am I by past? So I was born in Los Angeles. Um, my brother was an overachiever. My father was really an overachiever. My mother was an overachiever. And I was many years an underachiever until I got the message that, you know, you, you got to buckle up or, you know, you're going to be the black sheep. So finally, I think in high school, I started, you know, taking academics seriously. But my fallback was always when I was feeling isolated, it was always to go in my room, close the door, go in front of the typewriter and write. And sometimes it was maudlin poetry. And sometimes it was something I observed about my family. Um, and it just began to enrich my mind and, and, and it, it increase my belief in being able to perceive things in a different way. I was able to step outside of myself object, somewhat objectively. And then um, I um, got lucky, I got into Stanford and then the graduate school at Northwestern that I was uh, drafted in the army during the Vietnam conflict. Um, I got out of that and married my wife. We've been, we've been married 52 years and we have two children. We've moved around from New York to California to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and um, and all the t all in between, I've been working either at writing or an eight to five job or whatever to to support the family, and here I am. And how did you decide to write an actual book, like to put a novel together? When was that, and why so, did you decide? Yeah, so in 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 college. Um, I had some really uh, inspirational teachers, authors, and, and one was Wallace Stegner, um, who was, um, gosh, he's, he was sort of a sui generis. He, he was a Western writer. He was a literary writer. Um, he, he just has a way of being, he was an, an early environmentalist, and he's also a Joyce scholar. So someone like that, and people like him, um made me and others think that oh well we can try that i don't know if we're going to succeed <laughs> but it, when you're when you're in the presence of somebody who is both a great storyteller and has a charismatic personality um you, you should be influenced so um i you know so it, nothing happened in college and then in graduate school i was in journalism so that's a form of writing and self-expression that was good Um, that I got in the army, that wasn't so good. Um, but once I got out of the army and I had a regular job in a public, public relations firm, I, had, I carved out, I began to carve out time for, for writing. And I think I wrote for about two, three years before I published um, uh, my first novel. Okay, that's, that was my next question. Like how long did it take you to write the book? And did you go the traditional publishing or self-publishing? Well, this is way back in 19... 79, I believe. Um, is that right? No, 74. 74. And um, uh, traditional publishing, which was much easier then. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it's, and, and we were living in New York, in Brooklyn. And I, I swear there were at least 25 or 30, what we would call mainstream publishing houses. And, and uh, you know, you know it's, it, not that it was easy to get published, but it was a lot easier than today. And when you have maybe five, maybe six mainstream publishers and you've got, I don't know how many writers, you know, they, because with um, you know, social media, self-publishing, you know, the landscape has changed. But I, I wrote and got published mainstream for maybe 
uh, until, what are we now, until about 2008 or 2010. And then it became much more difficult because publishers, mainstream publishers, they have to make money. I understand that. And if they don't think your book is going to sell 50,000 hard copies, you know, they're not so interested in your track record or your vision of what you're writing about or even your competence. You know, it's, it's like, sure, every once in a while they publish a brilliant novel, often the first novel. Um, I didn't consider myself in that category, but I understood when they published something like Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever, um, they need that to, to survive. Right. And what advice would you give to an aspiring author today looking to either self-publish or go traditional publishing? Well, you can always try, you know, mainstream publishing. I mean, I still I still think it's a little more prestigious, but uh, it's not necessarily more rewarding in terms of sales. And um, you may not get as much marketing um, from a mainstream publisher as you would like. And then you end up doing it yourself which is what you would have done anyway, if you were self, self publishing. I think what I would recommend to anybody, um, I, I would say write for a reason, know why you're writing and, and be honest with yourself. If you say, oh, I'm gonna write a bestseller, that's okay, but you better dig down and, and know, well, what kind of book do you think is gonna be a bestseller? And is it, does it match your knowledge? Does it match your expertise? Does it match your writing style? And, and before you do any of that, I would spend a good deal of time just writing um, some short stories just to see if you have, what your craft is. And I would ask people that you trust, not just friends, but people as good readers, what, what they think of your manuscript. And I would use it, the, the early stages as a real learning experience in the real world and, and do a lot of reading, of course, and see what else is out there and what you like and don't like. And you said people need to know why they're writing. Do you want to share why you are writing? Sure. Um, well, I, I wrote um, in the beginning um, through the adolescent years as self-expression uh, self and uh, just to, you know, give myself um, comfort that I didn't fit in. And, um, and gra gradually when you do fit in, then you say, okay, well, I can, you know, go to the next stage, which in my mind was, okay, you've had a lot of uh, creative writing classes and you understand a, a bit about the craft. So pick a subject that, that you know will have, or you think will have some bona fides, at least among the reading public. And as it happened, my wife and I went um, on a trip to Club Med. Uh, I don't know if Club Med is still around, but um, it was um, a gathering of people and there were you know, they had the love beads and, you know, it was very hippie-esque. Um, and uh, I thought, gee, this would make a good novel. I can't call it Club Med. And we were in the Caribbean. So I called it Club Club Carib. <laughs> <laughs> and, to, and, and to my astonishment, you know, I got published. Um, I, I had an agent and, and I meant it for a specific audience, you know, very generic audience. There was an author called uh, Arthur Haley at the time who wrote, uh, books like uh, Hotel, Wheels, you know, he took a, a general milieu and tried to make it come to life on a day-to-day -day basis. So I did that with, with Club Med. Um, and I said, oh, this is, you know, cool. Okay, I got published. Um, and then um, uh, I wrote um, the second novel. I got very lucky and uh, Doubleday published it and it became a, a, a pretty much a bestseller. By, by, by most metrics. And um, then I thought, oh, well, you know, that was a two book contract. This is good, this is cool. And then when I came to write the second book, it was like, I felt too much pressure. I didn't want to write the same kind of book. They wanted me to write the same kind of book. And then, you know, when the energy doesn't flow all together in the right direction, you're going to hit some bumps, either consciously or unconsciously. And then you got to work your, your head around that um, if you want to continue. And I, and I tend to be stubborn enough that um, if I can't do something, you know, I'll try another genre or something else, but I will keep writing. I believe in writing to my last breath because it's me. It's my, how I express and define myself. Makes sense. Thank you for sharing. And when you did the... Um... 
the switch to self-publishing? What was the hardest for you? Well, well, the hardest thing was to, uh, to grasp that um, this is a, a revolution in, in, in publishing because suddenly um, uh, anyone can avail themselves of the tools on, on social media. And obviously Amazon was a big push on this. And, and it gave you a chance to have your writing read by other people just because you got rejected by whoever, you know, what was in the, in the publishing chair at Random House at the time <clears throat> and they're under financial pressure. So at least you got your book out there. And then it became quite obvious that, okay, if um, unless you had a really strong brand name, um, you had to do your own marketing and you had to be very clever at that. And you had a lot of competition. I, I think there's maybe, is it like 2 million novels are out there published in the last couple of years? Um, you know, it used to be, a. Um, um, 5,000 in 1976. So it's like, all right, so how do you distinguish yourself? And I, I'm always watching other writers and I'm learning from them uh, and on the marketing thing. You know, what's, what's new? What's the new technology? What's the breakthrough? Uh, and um, that's to me is part of the process now. It's not just the writing of the, of the book. It's the process of like, you know, how do you get your head up and, and make people see you? Can you give us like your top three most effective marketing tactics or methods? I was going to ask you that. Uh, the, um, you know, I don't know. You end up, uh, I ended up, um, you know, I hire a publicist and uh, or a social media specialist or, you know, somebody that knows the ropes of, you know, how to get reviews or, or how to get your book disseminated. Um, and then I published my last, my last four books have been self, uh, self published. And I, I published them on Amazon. Um, and there's the good and bad to that. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I don't know that if there's a magic formula, uh, we'd all be doing it. And, um, you know, the, the, the databases change and your opportunities change and the platforms change. So it's just like the speed of light now, you have to keep up with that. And do, do you, um, did you get good results from hiring someone to take care of that? Like, were you satisfied or you're like, oh no, I didn't get a return on my investment? Um, no, I, you know, it, uh, it depends what your expectations are, what you mean by your, your return on investment. But um, I say generally um, the, the first two books one was called the, um, well, the two, uh, Once Upon a Lie was one book, and the other one was The Reconstruction of Wilson Ryder, which was a book about an artist, being an artist who had a deformed face. And what is the meaning of beauty? Is it just physical beauty? Or how far deep in yourself do you have to go to understand real beauty? So it was a pretty weighty subject. And um, I, had, I had people that really liked it and, you know, almost got published by a mainstream publisher. But the, the, the gentleman that helped me, you know, get it out there and, and sell fairly well at the time, um, I liked him. And I, th and I thought he did a good job with social media, particularly. That's good. And I read in your bio that you like to talk about making mistakes and how they can serve you. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think not being afraid to make mistakes is how you learn. Not that you willingly want to make mistakes, but recognize that when you wrote, write something, it could be okay, but you could make it better. And that may not be a mistake, but it could be an opportunity to really, you know, make your prose tighter, you know, your transitions better, your characters better, because the, the more you write, the more complex you realize the art form is. And, and you just read a book in high school or college and it seems, oh, that seems, you know, that's whatever, that's Proust or that's Trollope or that's Faulkner. And, you know, they got their own style and, you know, this, you know, whatever. But it, when you look closely and you see there are certain rules that apply to good storytelling. And if you, and you always have to remember if I try to tell myself that it's a book in process. There's, there's the writer that creates something, but you have to have a reader to transmit to and respond to. 
because that's what you, you kind of always want. You don't want to be in a in solitary confinement, at least I don't, and just produce something. And then, you know, then your co second cousin from wherever says, I don't get it, Michael. I don't, I don't know why you did this to this character. You know, you, you want a, a broader spectrum of, of readers, better for better or worse, yeah. What writing project are you working on right now? So, um, I, it, um, I don't like to talk too much about it because I, I find that if you talk too early about a book, it's, it's, it's still fragile. It's fragile in your mind. And sometimes you get comments that are unsolicited and uh, they get in your head and it's like, I, did, I never thought of that. I don't like that idea. And suddenly, you know, you're re-questioning everything. I, I think it's the, the mental process of emotional process to, of creativity is something that's really hard to understand and it could be individualistic, right, for everybody. Uh, so I'm writing a story in general terms about um, um, East versus West, and it's a love story. And okay. uh, it, it takes place in Japan. Uh, it's an American who uh, goes over to um, return his uh, grandfather's samurai sword that he took from a Japanese, a dead Japanese officer in, the, in World War II. And um, the narrator, the grandson, feels that that was theft and that really belongs to the country and to the family. Of the, of, the, of the officer from whom he took the sword. And so he goes with the best of intentions, the best of, of Western, good Western intentions to return something, you know, as most people think we would like, if I had something from my childhood and someone found it, yeah, I'd like it back. But it's not so easy in, in other cultures. And you run into obstacles and you have to make decisions. And are they based on your values or are they based on the values of the host country? Okay, so do you know a lot about Japan? Um, my wife and I've been there uh, three times. Okay. And um, between the war stories that my father told at the dinner table and having Japanese friends, Japanese American friends, uh, and Japanese friends here, and then traveling, you kind of, you know, you get the, you get the idea of the, of the rhythm of life, of, of the cultural values, and particularly the religious values, you know, and that can be both Buddhism and, and Shintoism. Uh, I mean, Japan, Japan is an old culture, it's over 10,000 years old, and Shintoism has been around, I, I think, that 10,000 years, and that's the more fascinating religion to me than Buddhism. And when do you plan to publish that one? Do you have like a specific writing schedule or do you let creativity flow and whatever happens, happens? Well, you, you have to let creativity flow, um, but I'm, a, I'm a, a big believer that you should write every day, even if it's just one sentence, even if you're just correcting one word in one sentence. Because if you fall out of that rhythm, it's too easy to rationalize. And you say, well, I skipped it yesterday. I think this week I'm gonna take a week off. I've just known too many people that, you know, really good writers too, that suddenly I'm taking a break, you know, I'm taking a year off, I deserve it, or I just feel like it. And then it's really hard for them to get back in. And so I, I'm afraid of that. So I'd rather, you know, uh, so to answer your question, I hope to finish this book. I just started it maybe four, four or five months ago. So usually it takes at least 12 months uh, at least an original, original version, and then you want to do some, a lot of rewriting. Okay, so tell, it takes you normally 12 months to write it, and then how much time do you review it? Another uh, it, 12 months? Uh, uh, it could, it could be. I mean, I mean um, rewriting is everything in the sense that it's the difference for me, it's the difference between, okay, you, you crafted um, a version and it's pretty good, you know, but you know, you've been writing long enough that you can do better. And so to me, one of the, one of the motivations of writing, as I said, that upward trajectory, you want to kind of get better. You want to push yourself. You don't just want to get published or just want to be read from the creative side. You really want to, you know, dig deeper. And you ask yourself, does older age, is that a hindrance? Or do you finally have some well of of wisdom and craft knowledge that you can put into the written, on the written page. Yeah, I'd rather think it's an advantage from all your experience and everything you've seen in your life. I don't think that's 
a, an issue to be older. I think it's a, um, a benefit to add well, to your writing. It's certainly experientially, it's, yeah. it's absolutely because you have a much broader palette of colors, right? To, to, to work with. Um, I, I, just, I just think, you know, I know everybody ages differently and um, I've read articles on people who are in their 90s uh, and whatever their art form is, painting is, is obviously one of them for some, uh, but writers too. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, Saul Bellow and th these people wrote well into their late 80s. And, yeah, uh, and there is also a market for older readers so depending yes. on what you are wanting to write, like I wouldn't write for older readers than me because I don't feel I can relate to older people. And I feel like I need to write for people my age so I can relate to them. Like, I don't even feel like writing for younger people. I, I just feel like a disconnect in terms of like where I am in my life. So I feel like maybe when I'm older, I'll want to write for older uh, readers because I don't want to stop writing so you're an example for me 50 years writing that's so impressive yeah the, and, the other said you, sorry go ahead uh, I just had another question before we finish yes. uh, your rewriting pro, uh, process do you have like a set thing that you do let's say you read it over once and then you print it out and then you read it over and then better readers or is it just different from every book um, it's become a, a very um, predictable pattern for me. Uh, and that is, um, I, w one day I may not want to do any new fresh writing. I just want to go back and reread a certain chapter and to see if that was written correctly or it belongs where it belongs. So this thing about, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, you know, some parts are relatively easy and other parts you, you do a pretty good job, but you know, it's not as good as the rest of it that you did. So um, I, I think it's pretty arbitrary and it depends often on moods. Your moods when you, when, when you rewrite is very different than the, the mood you have to assume and the character voice you have to assume when you do the first draft. Yeah, it's a different hat, that's how I, yeah, I consider it like I'm wearing my writer hat and then I'm wearing my editor hat. So yeah. different, different uh, work that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And if uh, people want to you. know more about you, where can they connect with you? Oh, I, you know, uh, the michaelrfrench.com. Um, that'd be the easiest way. And that goes to various different links. So um, yeah, that was, that part's easy. <laughs> All right, I'll add the link in the show notes. Thank you so I, much for I, being on the show. Thank you for hosting this. I'm very, I'm very appreciative. Bye. Bye-bye.